thank you all for being here on a snowy night. Um, I just want to thank, uh, since this is Darwin Days, uh, I want to explain how Darwin Days comes to be. PRI organizes it in collaboration with Cornell, and we have two supporters over the last, this is our 10th year, by the way. Round of applause. Round of applause. Um, and uh, we are supported by uh, Cornell's Office of Community Affairs and also uh, a man who's never been to Ithaca uh, and is not a Cornellian, Derek Kaufman in New York City, who thinks evolution is really important. So um, thank you to them. Um, so we pick a theme every year, and, and honestly, I want to tell you that it doesn't work all the time. Um, we pick a theme because we thought over the years that um, you'd get bored coming to just the same old thing. So we, we pick themes and sometimes it's a huge success. The biggest success we had over the last uh, few years was Darwin and domestication. Um, because of course it's an ag school, right? And so we brought out all kinds of people who never would come to Darwin Days. Huge success. We've had other uh, themes that have been less of a success. This year we said, we don't care. Um, we're going to do a theme that, that interests us. Um, and so I want to explain that a little bit because we're, we're going to do a little audience participation uh, at the end. And we really want to uh, learn from you tonight. The theme this year is, is, as you may have seen, evolution in your backyard. There's a little bit of, of heavy duty intellectual underpinning here, which I'll keep very short which is that if you know anything about evolution, you probably looked at a textbook or watched a, uh, a video at some point and with somebody, usually with a British accent, saying something about some place far from here. The Galapagos, uh, you know, something in some exotic place, or you went to the lab of ornithology to something with somebody who went to some interesting place, right, the Amazon or Mongolia or something. and. That's, that's all well and good, because this is Ithaca, and we think that we know everything about the world, but for the vast majority of people, of course, they don't travel. And our experience as educators uh, has been that people think that evolution is this thing that people do in far-off places. And, of course, that's true. But that means, as educators, that we have a problem, right, which is that People think that evolution is some esoteric thing that they cannot participate in that is somewhere else and they have no experience with it. So uh, as, as evolution educators over the last 20 years that we've been thinking about this, we have begun to develop some ideas uh, uh, that are still not completely formed uh, that um, will allow, we think, will allow people, will encourage people to literally, and we really mean this literally, go outside, maybe not tonight, but go outside and look at nature, big quotes, nature, and see evolution either happening or see that it's patently obvious that evolution has occurred. That's, a, that's the goal. Because, and I don't probably don't have to tell this audience this, but there's a huge, just a massive disconnect. The disconnect is that every biologist who knows anything since 1882, and I picked that date because that's the year Darwin died, every biologist who knows anything, there's, there's not a gentler way to say that, every biologist who knows anything since 1882 has known that evolution is true. I'm going to say that again. Again, I'm not patronizing you because of the Science Cabaret audience, but usually when I say that, I get blank stares, but I want to say it again. Nobody who knows anything has doubted that evolution is true since 1882. So if you go to, oh, and the best, ex the best example of that is to go to the Cornell Library, go to, I, I should look at the age distribution here. Oh, I don't need to say that a library is a place where there are books. Um, <laughs> but if you go to, to Olin, or uh, actually you have to go to the library at Annex now, or Man, but look at the shelf of books on evolution from the late 19th century. There are hundreds of them. Hundreds of them. And I guarantee you that any book written by anybody who knows anything, post-1870 almost, 
is about evolution, the mechanisms by which it occurs, not whether it occurred. Okay, it's just a historical fact. Maybe evolution is bunk, but nobody has thought that since 1882. Okay? So, that's the way science views the world. But of course, I don't need to tell you probably that the vast majority of humanity does not view the world that way. Um, you probably know that somewhere in the vicinity of 40% of Americans uh, doubt evolution or believe in evolution, depending on which way the poll is phrased, but less than half. Okay, so once more, one more time, every single biologist for a hundred and something years knows that evolution is true, and most people who aren't scientists don't think that way. Now, that's not good, right? There's a, it's not even close, right? It's not like 52% of biologists and 47% of the rest of the world. It's this massive disconnect. So how can that be? And our theory, and there's lots of reasons, well, our theory is that one contributing factor is that it's so darn hard to see evolution in your own backyard. So that's the excuse for this week. And we had um, a, we've, we've had, this is the fourth event I think this week, we had a, an event on Sunday at the Nature Center uh, focused around dogs. And, of course, everybody's familiar with dogs. Dogs are an example of evolution because all domesticated dogs are the results of human-mediated evolution. Then we showed Microcosmos. If you have not seen, who was at Microcosmos? Anybody? We had, it was almost, uh, there were no empty seats at Cinemopolis. If you haven't seen it, it's a magnificent film. It's almost no narration, no plot, no nothing. An hour and a half of ultra close-ups of insects. It will take your breath away. It's the ultimate evolution in your backyard film. And then last night, we had a fantastic panel discussion with four uh, biologists just telling stories. It was, I just, it was just a wonderful thing. They were just telling fun stories about their favorite organism. Tonight, what I'm gonna do is a little, be a little more didactic and, and say to you kind of, what, how does this work? How might you, or your friends, or your kids, or your grandmother, literally go out in the backyard when it's a little warmer and see evolution. Okay, so that's where I'm going. So you can nod off now. Okay, so I, as, as uh, Kitty pointed out, I um, have an eight-year-old. She's in the back there doing something. Hi, Alex. Wave to everybody, Alex. So, um, Alex is, is terrific. She asks lots of questions, as all eight-year-olds do. And any of you who interact with eight-year-olds uh, will know that you get, uh, if you're out in the world, out in nature, you will get this question. Um, why is it that way? Some version of that question. You'll often get, what is it? And that's, that is a different question, which I'm skipping over, okay? You will get, what is it? But, um, I'm skipping that over. Very soon after you sit, after you make up an answer to the what is it, you'll get this. How come? And often, this question is, is phrased, at least often with Alex, it's, what is that for? And so I've picked, um, I change this slide every once in a while, but I've, I, I pick some of my favorite examples of what, again, uh, you see on nature television, again with the British accent, um, is superb, perfect adaptation. The cheetah runs. It is a killing machine, right? You've all heard that kind of thing, right? The elephant's trunk is supremely adapted to fetch vegetation and deliver it to the mouth. This is my personal favorite. I'm not an entomologist, so I don't know what critter this is, but this is a stick, and that's a caterpillar. Isn't that awesome? Um, there's a, the obligatory leaf insect down there in the lower left. There's a mantis that lives only in certain uh, orchids and is, and is cryptic against those orchids, so it ambushes whoever wanders in. The, the, the obligatory giraffe. Um, the uh, Venus flytrap, and then this is a new one for me because I just came back from my very first trip to Galapagos uh, over the holidays, and the, the bird there, 
in the lower uh, part of the slide is a Nazca booby. Uh, there are three species of boobies in Galapagos. Uh, this is the less famous one. And this has a, uh, an amazing feature to it. It dives, it goes up in the air like this, and then it folds its wings and goes down into the water at something like 90 miles an hour. And if you've ever, just imagine that to your, you know, like those of you who, who jump off, you know, and, and hold your nose, imagine doing that at 90 miles an hour. So it turns out the Nazca booby does not, is the, one of the only birds, maybe the only bird that does not have external nostrils. Makes sense, right? Because if it had external nostrils, it would, uh, as, as the naturalist in the Galapagos said, its brains would get blown out by the water going into its nostrils. Okay, so all of this is what? All of this is, that's why it's there. It's there because it's a really good idea. Right? These organisms are supremely fitted to do what they do. And Darwin did not invent that answer. <laughs> Darwin did not invent that answer. Little known factoid is that, um, uh, this guy didn't invent it either, but he made it popular. A guy named William Paley was a Anglican clergyman, as most educated science types were, when Darwin, before Darwin was born, Darwin was born, as you now know, Darwin was born in 1809. 1809. In 1802, William Paley wrote a book called Natural Theology. And that book was basically filled with stories like this. And the whole book, great big thick book like this, the whole book was filled with beautiful descriptions of beautiful fits of organisms to the environment. And, and the purpose of the book was to describe those in beautiful detail and then to say that those were examples of the beneficence of an omniscient deity. That was called natural theology and it was a, a large intellectual enterprise in late 18th, early 19th century Britain. That was biology before Darwin. Natural theology was the explanation for this. And I, I agonize over that little story there. And by the way, Darwin loved Paley, read all of Paley, and in one of history's great coincidences, lived in the same dorm room as Paley <laughs> had at Cambridge. Um, so Darwin was very familiar with Paley. Darwin did not invent the explanation for these. Okay? Now, dramatic pause. That means that you don't need evolution to explain perfect adaptation or very good adaptation. I'm going to pause there because most of you, you should, if you're awake and thinking about this, that should puzzle you for a second. Because you've all learned that, most of you, that Darwinian evolution is the explanation for all these wonderful adaptations. But you don't need that explanation. There's a perfectly good alternative explanation, which is, God did it. Insert your favorite supernatural creator noun. Okay? And that's really interesting. That means that when you open your evolution textbook in high school or college, and you see all these pictures, or when you watch David Attenborough, or when you watch, watch nature television, or when you come to my museum, and you see all these examples of how amazing evolution is, you're not actually looking at evidence for evolution. You're looking at a bunch of stories that could just as easily support natural theology. Dramatic pause. So I want you to think deeply about that, because it's true. It's really true. It's evidence for evolution by Darwinian natural selection, but only if you already believe in Darwinian natural selection. Okay? So, I'll let you brood on that conundrum for a second. And I'll give you another set of pictures here. So, suppose Alex asks me about these critters. Why is it that way? Well, the, our local trilobite in the uh, upper left there, Phacops rana, why is it that way? How come it looks like that? 
Um, since we can't experiment on trial bytes, we could probably have another hour, we could have an hour conversation about theories of that. Um, the Galapagos tortoise there on the lower left, how come it looks like that? How come there are tortoises on the Galapagos? Is that perfect? Um, uh, who has had your wisdom teeth out? Who, raise your hand if you had your wisdom teeth out. Okay, maybe third. Um, raise your hand if you know you have them, but didn't have them out. Anybody? Okay. Who knows they didn't have them? This is a mostly uh, European audience, so that's pretty typical. Okay. Most of us have faces too short for our teeth. Okay? And there's a particularly bad one there. Any dentists in the room want to look at that x-ray there? Um, uh, the bird on the lower right is a hornbill. It is not Toucan Sam. Um, it's a hornbill. It lives in Southeast Asia, not in the Amazon. The giant panda there, the giant panda is a bear, but it's a bear that eats bamboo. No self-respecting bear eats bamboo, except a giant panda. And the beautiful little organism on the upper right there is an axolotl, which is in the same genus as our local spotted salamander, except it never grows up. Lives in Mexico and never loses its gills. And then uh, my favorite, and I owe Cole Gilbert, who's an entomology professor who told me that he did a science cabaret just very recently. Um, he talked about this last night, and so I added it um, in his honor. That's uh, a slug, right? What's the hole in the side of it? I'll let you think about that for a second. Okay, so when Alex asks me all of these questions, these are not David Attenborough, the slug goes across the savanna. It is perfectly adapted to catch the mushroom. <laughs> right? He doesn't say that, does he? The panda is superbly adapted to eat bamboo. So superbly adapted that it must eat for 15 hours a day and poops continuously. <laughs> Your third molars are superbly adapted, so well adapted that you end up in the hospital. <laughs> okay, you get the idea. So, what we didn't tell you when we taught you evolution in high school and college, if we taught you evolution at all, what we didn't tell you is we didn't tell you most about, much about this. We told you about the cheetah, and we told you about the leaf insect, and we told you about all that because that's how marvelous nature is. But we didn't tell you about these other instances that don't seem to be evidence for evolution. You're not going to tell us about the slug hole? Not yet. Patience, Don. Go back to your phone. Um, so I just picked... I, so the, the figure in the upper uh, left there, if you don't know, is the only illustration in the origin of species. The, the origin of species only have, I won't embarrass anybody by asking who has not read it. I'll just say if you haven't read it, you're not an educated person. Um, the only illustration in the origin is in the upper left. And here's some, you know, randomly selected recent versions of these. These are evolutionary trees. You've all seen them. Um, what do these trees say? Right? They say change, right? I mean, that's the whole point, uh, that evolution is about change. Ask almost anybody, that's what they'll say. Evolution is about change. And there's birds, and there's beetles, and there's primates. Evolution is about change. And that, of course, that's true. But what we neglect to point out is that evolution is also about lack of change. So I'm experimenting. This is your first guinea pig moment. I'm experimenting with this diagram tonight. Um, this is uh, what paleontologists call a time morphology diagram. I changed it to a, a time feature diagram. And so time is, is on the vertical there from old to young. Uh, and feature is shape of the body, biochemistry, behavior, whatever you want, language, anything. And so in red there is lack of change, okay? That's, that's features that don't change through time. Now think about that for a second. You look just like your mother. And Labrador Retrievers have Labrador Retrievers, right? That's called inheritance. So inheritance exists, we all know that. Inheritance exists, that means there's lack of change. 
Okay, so red is inheritance. The little green thing there is the other stuff, okay? You don't look just like your mother. You don't look like either parent. You have this other feature. And that's the change part. And it happens on a generational basis, but of course it also happens in evolution. And when evolutionary biologists use a diagram like this, we tend to draw a, a slanted line like this. And so those evolutionary trees, even if they don't have axes on them, this is what they're, these, this, these are the axes. That there's change through time, it's the slope of the line, right? So here's the thing. There's still a, a red arrow there, right? There's still inheritance. There's still a bunch of stuff that doesn't change. And there's some other stuff that does change. And mostly what we focus on is the stuff that changes, right? Because that's what we all want to know. We all want to know how come we have, as a great evolutionary biologist said, we all want to know why there are tigers and palm trees and things. <laughs> we want to know where all this cool stuff came from. We don't, don't tell me about no change. I want to know about change. So, welcome to your backyard in, what, six months? <laughs> so, um, I've tried this with Cornell students. You know, I've even said when you go out to slope day, and I've lost them right after that. Right? <laughs> but if you go out to live slope when it's green, this is appalling. I, 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 how many kids have actually picked a blade of grass? and held it in their mouth. At least, in my experience, the number of undergraduates who've done that, or at least remember doing that, is pretty small. Um, everybody should do it, right? Because it's fun, because you can make whistling noises, because you will discover something fascinating if you do that. Grass is crunchy. Grass, grass contains broken glass. Grass has little spicules of silica in it. That's why it's gritty. It's all kinds of fun stuff you can learn if you just chew on grass. But if my daughter asks me, Daddy, how come the grass looks like that? How do you go about answering that question? So you're, you're lying there on live slope and you're looking at the grass. Or more likely, you're looking at something else and somebody asks you, how come the grass looks like that? What are you going to do? Uh, I don't see it changing right now, so could we talk about something else? What do you need to ask? What, what kinds of information do you need to begin to address that question? Okay, your kid is asking you, tell me where this came from, Dad, right now. What kind of information do you need? It's not changing in front of you, right? So what kind of information do you need? What you need is you need to know um, um, uh, where it came from. Um, um, well, uh, who's it related to? Like, give me something, you know. Um, what's, what's the TV show? Uh, uh, call in a favor or whatever it is, right? Um, yeah, right, Lifeline, right. Here's another fun example. Ask people if grass has flowers. I love that one. You get blank stares. Okay? Why, why does grass not have flowers? Because we mow it. Because we mow it. Isn't that great? I've actually had biology majors say to me that they've never seen unmown grass. Well, this is, of course, what unmown grass looks like. Grass has flowers. Flowers. Grass has flowers? Now, some of you are like, oh, I knew that. Now, look at, now just think about it for a second. I don't want to say too much. Think about it for a second. What are you now thinking? <laughs> oh, it's, it's like related to something. It's like related to something else that has flowers. Now, what are you doing? Now you are thinking about time. It's forced itself on you. You are now thinking, because grass has a feature that hasn't changed compared to an oak tree or a daffodil or a water lily, you are now thinking in terms of time. 
Isn't that weird? Lack of change is now getting you to think about where change came from. While you're weirding out on that, another example, Don, this is our local native slug. If uh, slug season is not too far away, uh, it looks like we'll have a good slug season because it's going to be a wet spring. So we're going to have a good slug season, but sadly most of the slugs you're going to see in Ithaca are not this. Uh, you're going to see a big yellow slug uh, most of the time, and that is a, uh, an introduction from Europe. But this is our native slug. It's called the leopard slug, which makes it sound much more pretty than most of us kind of think it is. But it is pretty uh, if you're a malacologist, right, Marla? Right. It's actually invasive. I'm sorry. <laughs> the leopard slug is invasive? Yes. From where? Europe. Are you sure? <laughs> Don't listen to her, she's a malacologist. Yeah, we'll find out later. Um, slugs are snails. Dramatic pause. Lots of people don't know that, right? Slugs aren't snails, slugs are slugs. But slugs are shellless snails, right? So once you're thinking about that, what do most people think they are? Worms, right? They think they're worms. Um, I mean, stop people on the street and ask them what a slug is, right? It's fun. Um, are you sure they're invasive, Marla? Um, okay, so when you pick up a slug and look at the right-hand side of it, or the right slug side of it, there's a hole in the side of the slug. A perfectly round hole and you can actually stick something in it, and, and there's a cavity in there. It's not like, you know, it's not like your ear where it kind of, your finger kind of dead ends in here. There's a big cavity right in here. And it's called what malacologists call the mantle cavity. Um, but forget that name. It's a hole in the side of the slug, and the air goes in and goes out. And if you Manipulate your slug a little bit and do some things on it. What do you find out? You find out that that's how the slug breathes. So the slug needs to breathe, right? Everybody needs to have oxygen. All animals need to have oxygen. So the slug is a snail. Most snails, almost all snails, um, live either in or very near water. This guy lives on dry land only, as you know, in, in wettish places. So it's not really happy where it's dry. So what does it do? It breathes through a hole in the side of its neck. I don't know if slugs do. Marla, do slugs have necks? You missed my talk last month. <laughs> so here's my question. Here's my question. If you had designed this beautiful invasive organism <laughs> to breathe on land, how would you have designed it? Any engineers here? Yes. You need a wet surface. You need a wet surface, he said. Absolutely. You have a wet surface to breathe with. It just happens to be inside your body. Right? So, why do slugs have holes in the side of their non-necks? Why do, Daddy, why do slugs have holes in them? All snails don't have holes in their neck. I study marine snails. My snails are self-respecting. They don't have holes in the sides of their bodies. How do they breathe? How do they breathe? They breathe with gills. They live in the water. These guys live on land. Gills don't work on land. Why, Daddy, does a slug have a hole in the side of it? Is it perfectly adapted? <laughs> is, there, is there water in that hole? No, it's just a little wet with a whole lot of blood vessels. Invasive blood vessels. <laughs> okay, anybody know what this is? Snapping turtle. This is our local snapping turtle, um, which is it is not invasive. It is native to most of the United States. Um, it is not the alligator snapping turtle, which is the size of a small car. Um, this, this thing gets up to maybe no more than a foot or two. Um, and they're very common around here. Um, so, 
here's an animal in your backyard. Uh, my daughter, Alex, had the wonderful experience of doing summer camp at the Nature Center one year, and somebody brought in a whole pan full of eggs. And that, we, got, we got to um, take care of them at camp. You got to watch them hatch and, and take care of them at yeah. camp. Okay, so these things are native. Okay? So, why are they there? Daddy, why do these things look like they do? They're turtles. They're turtles. So why do turtles look like they do? Because turtles are clearly adapted so that they are protected from predators. They have an impenetrable shell and formidable offensive weaponry. I practiced that part of it. <laughs> Why do turtles look like they do? This is the inside of our common snapping turtle. I don't know if you've ever done this before, but look at the inside of a turtle shell. They're all the same, almost all the same. Look at the inside of a turtle shell sometimes. What is the turtle's shell? What is it? So that's a loaded question. I mean, it's a shell. It's a backbone, she said. Well, this is the inside of the turtle's shell. So you see that there is a, there is what looks like the vertebral column there, and that indeed is what it is. What is the shell? It's this. And then it flares out, right? The turtle's shell, all turtle shells, with very few exceptions, are expanded ribs. So somebody didn't say, I think I'm going to make a tank. I'm going to take a snake and put it through a rock, and it will be well protected. I, a kid said that to me one time. <laughs> Turtles are just normal reptiles with massively flared out and fused ribs. Why do turtle, why are turtles built that way? That's a subtly but very importantly different question or answer than the David Attenborough answer. Turtles are built this way because they resist predators. But they're also built this way because they have ribs. And those ribs are massively wide compared to yours. And they're fused together. And oh, by the way, they have a surficial layer, which you don't have. They have something called dermal bone, which you don't have. Dermal bone is bone that grows in your skin. Many, reptile, many living reptiles have it. Um, and that's what the outside of a turtle shell is. It has nothing to do with the ribs. So the answer to why does the turtle have a shell? Two, two answers. Neither in British accent. Okay, more backyard or in your house. Daddy, what is this? I don't know, kill it. <laughs> Trick question. How many wings does a fly have? Two. Two. How many wings do Diptera? That's right, Diptera. Two winged. Flies are the only major group of insects that have only two wings. How many wings does everybody else have? Four. Think dragonfly. Almost every other insect has four wings. Flies have two. Okay? Cue David Attenborough. Why do flies only have two wings? Because. I have no idea why flies have two wings. <laughs> but flies have another feature besides two wings. Flies have a little gizmo that nobody else has, no other insect has. They have a little gizmo attached to the segment of their body immediately behind their pair of wings. And it has a fancy name, it's called the halter, but what it does is it moves around and it acts like a gyroscope. There's a pair of them. There's one on each side. And you can manipulate fly and do experiments to prove that, or to, to indicate that, that, that flies use these to maintain their balance. So the reason you can't swat a fly isn't just because they have amazing eyes. The reason you can't swat a fly is because they have amazing maneuverability. And it is in part the halter that gives them that amazing maneuverability. So why do flies have two wings? 
because they don't have four. What is the halter? Oh, well, you think you're really smart, right? You say a modified wing. Oh, I'm really smart. No, it isn't. It's a little doodly bopper on the back of, behind the wing. You infer that it's a modified wing because you think you're smart. Okay, so if Alex says to me, Daddy, how come the fly has the little halt air? She's probably about a year from asking me that. Or an hour. Or an hour. <laughs> what do I say? I say, well, you know, it's there because it allows the fly to do this cool thing. And she says, no, that's not what I mean. <laughs> how come grasshoppers don't have halt airs? So, uh, also in your backyard, in a, in a way, is this skeleton uh, up at the museum. Um, many of you know that uh, we got her because we were uh, making inquiries about uh, wanting a whale for our new museum about 15 years ago. And we uh, were, were sending emails and asking, can we get a whale? And um, we got a phone call. Yes? Can I tell a story? No. Um, at the end. Um, and we got a phone call that said, you, there's a North Atlantic right whale on the coast of New Jersey and you can have it if you want. We were very excited because two reasons. One is North Atlantic right whales are the rarest large whale species in the world, 350 of them, blah, blah, blah. But the other reason is that if you're an evolutionary biologist, you have seen a right whale at some point because it's in almost every evolution textbook uh, because they have very large bones hanging underneath their tail. So as soon as I heard right whale, I was like, yes! They have big bones hanging under their tail. And so we have this thing hanging in a museum mostly devoted to fossils. It is not a fossil, although we do have people walk in and say, there's the dinosaur. Um, <laughs> and the reason we have it there is because it's really fun to look at, and it's fun to have, get a wedding, uh, rent the space and have a wedding under. But we also have it there because we have an exhibit, as some of you know, that prompts you to think about what those little bones are. Okay, here we go. What are those little bones? Pelvis. Pelvis. Any other thoughts? These? They're actually what used to be legs. What used to be legs. Fascinating. Okay, what are, what's the difference between these two answers? Pelvis, what used to be legs. They're not, with all due respect, they are not a pelvis. Pretty clearly they're not a pelvis. They're two little bones hanging under the tail. Wow, wait a minute. What are they? They are two. Used to be legs. They used to be legs. What? <laughs> People ask very frequently, well, wait a minute. Are you sure those were there? I said, yeah, pretty sure, because although I didn't cut them out of the rotting flesh, my staff did, and yeah, they were there. Why are they there? Do they have a function? Why are they there? They are, these interpretations do agree on something, right? They used to be something else. Well, the whale shows another fun feature, which is its nose. Whales have noses. Did you know that? Whales do have noses. So let's look at the nose of the whale. The nose of the whale is what you probably know as the blowhole. Where, where is your blowhole? <laughs> let's don't get too graphic here, but where is, <laughs> where is your blowhole? Right here, right? And you have, and you have, this is you, and you have Two little bones. Who's broken their nose? Not a tough crowd. Okay. <laughs> when you break your nose, as opposed to just really banging up your nose, when you break your nose, you break this. Okay? It's just, it's a little pair of bones. If you're over, if you're about my age, they're, they're starting to fuse and not be two bones anymore. But for youngsters, they are two bones with a line down the middle. So they're two bones. They're right here. So everybody, okay, everybody. You're not participating. Everybody touch your nose, okay? So, and run your fingers down until it gets past the hard part. Okay? That's the end of the bone. After that, it's cartilage. Right? And so, here's the end of that bone right there. So, we look at our whale, and we say, 
Where's the whale's nose? It doesn't have a nose, right? Because here's the front end of it, and it doesn't have a hole. Yes, it does. You all know, there she blows, right? Wait a minute. I have to go all the way up to the top of its head to find an opening that's its nose. And sure enough, right behind that blowhole are two little bones. Not one bone, not five bones, but two bones. So, what is the whale's blowhole? It's a trick question. It's a blowhole. <laughs> right? It's not a nose, it's a blowhole. You know, think about using a Kleenex, right? I mean, think, you know, really push it here, okay? Is it a nose? No, it's not a nose, it's a blowhole. Is your nose a blowhole? Let's don't go there. <laughs> right? So why does the whale have a blowhole? So it can surface and breathe and go back under. Why does the whale's blowhole look like it does? Um, here's uh, me with darker hair, um, holding the bones after they come out of, of horse manure. We made a cast of the bones so that you can see at the museum. Here's the textbook diagram of a right whale. Um, uh, occasionally, right whales are found with external hind limbs. True external appendages. And here's uh, a dead right whale with an external uh, appendage, and, and somebody wrote a paper about it in 1921, and here's what they had. Whales actually sometimes do have external hind appendages. Okay, if, uh, if you go to the museum, this, is, this picture is several years old, it's quite a bit taller now, but they're, they're scattered around the rest of town. This is called a dawn redwood, called Meta Sequoia. And Meta Sequoia is really fun because it was discovered as a fossil before it was discovered as a living tree, right, Don? Absolutely. And, and so, I'm not gonna make that mistake again. Um, <laughs> Marla. Um, and Don, when was it found in China, do you know? Um, let's see, 19th or 20th? Wilson, and I believe it was in the 19-teens. Okay, so in the 20th century, somebody first recognized that in China, there was this tree, and the uh, uh, foliage is there on the right, that looked exactly like this fossil from 15 million years ago. In North America, by the way, the fossils live in North America, but the living tree lived in China. But of course, we messed that up, and we brought it everywhere. So now Meta Sequoia lives everywhere. But it originated, I mean, it used to live just in China. Um, why did it just live in China? Because it liked it there? Because taxes were lower? I mean, what? why did it just live in China when it used to live here? I'll let you think about that. Okay, so, in the ultimate backyard, evolution, we started to call this evolution your bathroom, but the staff said that would be wise. <laughs> um, okay, so you choose your moment. In the next 24 hours, we're counting on you. We want you to find all of these features on your body. Okay, we've already done the wisdom teeth, third molars. Who here can wiggle their ears? One, two, three, four, five. You can't wiggle yours. Six, seven, eight. Wow, this is a wiggly bunch. Okay, so uh, seven people can wiggle their ears. All of us, every single one of us has ear muscles. Every single one of us. Cut, cut, cut right back here and you'll find ear muscles. What's that about? Daddy, how come I have ear muscles if I can't wiggle my ears? Um, you have a bunch of features which you were probably told are vestigial. That's usually the word. Lots of things wrong with that word that I won't talk about, but you were probably told that there's a bunch of stuff in your body that doesn't make sense. Third molars are especially personal to me. I've never had appendicitis, but I had all four wisdom teeth impacted and infected. So I have a personal stake in that one. Um, you have a bunch of things that don't make a lot of sense. And um, what does that mean, make a lot of sense, by the way? that David Attenborough would not narrate them. 
right? The ear muscles are carefully adapted to wiggle your ears when your mother-in-law comes. Okay, and we've already done third molars. Okay, um, anybody ever broken their tailbone? How bad is that? Oh my God, she said, yes, right. Oh my God, I never broke it, but I bruised it and it lasted six months, okay? So, what did I just say? Has anybody ever broken your tailbone? Excuse me, I do not have a tail. I have bones, I have a coccyx. I do not have a tail. Well, that's funny because it's in exactly the same place as a monkey's tail and made out of exactly the same looking bones. Oh, but wait. This is, I have, a, I have a little indicator of slides that get rises out of undergraduates. This is one of those slides. You guys didn't rise to the occasion, but undergrads would be freaking by now. Yes, these are real pictures. Um, and it turns out that in uh, humans of European descent, in a small fraction of 1%, um, babies are born with external tails. In the 20th century, they're routinely clipped off and probably the doctor doesn't even write it down. I won't ask for details. Um, what in the world is this about? Right, you're all too refined. None of you went, ah! Think about it. The locker room just reels, right? I mean, just... Think about that for a second. Um, a friend of, of, uh, of Alex's, actually, um, a little girl uh, was going into, uh, her father works with my wife, and, um, and she was going to the hospital, and, and the guy says, oh yeah, she's going to the hospital, she's got to have the hole in her neck tied up after all these years. What? Turns out, in a very small fraction of, of uh, people of European descent, I say it that way, by the way, because that's the data that I've seen. It, it varies with ethnic groups. Um, there's something called branchial cleft remnant. That is the medical term. And you are born with a hole, a true hole, in the side of your neck. It goes all the way through into your pharynx, and you can stick a probe all the way through there. And uh, as this eight-year-old girl uh, was having done, it's not a immediate, it's not, it's not life-threatening, but you know, it can stuff can fall out and um, it can get infected and so forth. So you know, you just go in and sew it up and get some plastic surgery and so forth. What in the world is going on? Somebody is putting holes in babies' necks. And David Attenborough will not mention that, right? Okay, so um, this is us at three to four weeks and five to six weeks and this is really us, right? I mean, this is not like the guy with the tail or the girl with the branchial cleft remnant. This is us. This is what all of us look like three to four weeks from conception, okay? This is pretty clearly going to be your head. This is pretty clearly going to be your eye. This is pretty clearly going to be your forelimb, your hand. This is pretty clearly going to be your hind limb. WTF. <laughs> Two weeks later, this is a lot smaller, right? This is you, folks. This is really you. Why do you have a tail when you're four weeks old? And maybe later. And then that leaves us with perhaps the my favorite example because we know actually much less about this than I thought. I'm certainly not an OBGYN or even an anthropologist, but when my daughter was born, I got interested in this and uh, found out that we do not know as much about this as you would think. Um, you may know, all of you may know, that in many, not all, um, modern American, let's just stick with American, European, uh, populations, birth is difficult. Um, please do not raise your hand if you tell me that birth is not difficult. Please don't raise your hand if you think birth is difficult because of the Western Industrial Medical Complex. I know all that. For some large number of women of European descent, birth is difficult. 
We can hash it out later. Why is that the case? Well, it's the case, and this is, you know, you probably all know this, that if you, uh, if you go look at, uh, I, I did this very carefully, I looked for very active women, right? I looked at, at women basically of the same kind of activity level as men, and you don't have to be an anthropologist to see that the shape of the women's bodies is different than the men's bodies, right? And the reason for that shape difference is that at puberty, among other secondary sex characters, the hips widen, right, of human females. And they widen for a perfectly uh, understandable David Attenborough reason, so that this relatively enormous fetal head can pass through the birth canal. And the birth canal is this, is this opening right here. Okay, so why is birth difficult? I thought the hips widen. Well, the problem is, if you want to call it a problem, the problem is that they don't widen enough all the time, right? And they don't widen enough, goes the explanation, so that these athletic women can do what they're doing. Because, if there are any engineers in the room, if we widen these, if we widen the hips further, what's going to happen? Then this angle is going to get even steeper and biomechanically, or just plain mechanically, women will reach a point where they cannot locomote bipedally, right? So, this is a classic textbook example of what's called an evolutionary trade-off. So, our heads got big, big heads are good, we want big brains, so we have these babies with really big heads, and, um, we, oh, wait a minute, now we gotta get them out, so we widen the hips, and we, oh, but wait, we can't widen them too much because then the females won't be able to locomote and run away from the lion, so um, it's a trade-off. We're gonna widen them as much as we can, speaking teleologically here, but not too much. And of course, what's the, what's the, uh, the, the end result of this? The end result of this is quite fascinating, and, and the reason turns out to be, if there are any OBGYNs here, talk to me afterwards, um, the reason turns out to be, why we don't know much about this, by the way, is because as soon as Western medicine reaches a human population, they start collecting data. But as soon as Western medicine reaches a human population, they start intervening in human birth. So we actually don't know the, the rate of death and childbirth in a pre-modern, non-medical population. Isn't that amazing? We actually don't know. There are just a couple of studies and they're not very good. So, here's what we do know. That the black, the black shapes there is the fetal head. The white ovals are the birth canal. Um, Alides is a monkey. Um, Nasalis is a monkey. Macaca is a monkey. Hylobates is a monkey. Monkeys are actually similar to us. Monkeys have really big-headed babies and small birth canals. Why? Because they have small body sizes, not because they have big-headed babies, because they have bulk, small body sizes. The apes, who are our relatives down below, Pongo is the orangutan, Pan is the chimp, Gorilla is the gorilla, and there's us. Okay? If you watch a chimp give birth, boom, out the door, everything's fine. <laughs> the fetal head size is relatively very small compared to the birth canal. No problem. And so what we've developed is a solution. Humans have developed a unique feature of the birth process. And if you've ever watched a birth or know anything about birth, it's called the rotation. So the birth canal, the human birth canal, turns out to have a dog leg in it. It has an angle in it. And in order to get this relatively large fetal head out of this birth canal, it rotates 90 degrees when it's halfway through. Why? <laughs> Why? Why? So it turns out that Alex um, wasn't born until after 12 hours of labor. Um, and so finally she had to have a, uh, she was born by uh, C-section. And so I, I interviewed the the obstetrician quite, the, the parent obstetricians quite aggressively afterwards, and I said, so what happened? And she said, I have no idea. It's just, it just happens. 
you know, there might be a little lip in there somewhere on the bone. There might be, you know, it wasn't wide enough. It happens all the time. Okay, now think like David Attenborough. The birth canal is beautifully adapted to cause maximal pain and discomfort to the mother. Okay, last slide. Why are these things this way? They are this way because of change, of course, but they're this way equally because of no change. And so here's the punchline of evolution in your backyard. You, you can see evolution happen in the flu vaccine, right? This year is a particularly good example. Anybody gotten the flu even if you had a flu shot? Why? Didn't cover it. Why? The virus mutated. Turns out it's one mutation. Rob McKenzie just told me this. It's one mutation in the flu virus this year. So, and so if you're if you're speaking to an American audience, you say mutation. If you're speaking to scientists, you say evolution. Um, the flu virus evolved. Uh, um, antibiotic resistance uh, happens all the time. Um, insecticide resistance happens all the time, right? AIDS uh, treatment resistance. You can watch, You can see evolution that way. What about all this other stuff? How about palm trees and tigers and things? Here's the irony. When you go out in your backyard, you don't actually usually see evolution happen. What you see is features that don't make any sense in light of current function. What you see are a series of jury-rigged contraptions of ad hoc assemblages that are good enough, David Attenborough notwithstanding. There's some amazing functions. I mean, uh, organisms are incredibly well suited to their environment, except when they're not. And so, here's our little homework assignment, and I won't do it now. I'm going to pass around this bag. Um, everybody take a leaf. This is courtesy of Bull's Flowers. I just, they're the only source of anything green in Ithaca uh, right now. So, um, everybody take a leaf and take it home with you. And here's your homework assignment. Um, take a leaf. There's, uh, apparently it's mostly roses for obvious reasons, but um, uh, there's some other leaves in there. Take a leaf and here's your homework assignment. Daddy, Mommy, why does this leaf look this way? Now, of course, the answer is, it looks this way because it's suited to do what it does well enough. But it also looks this way because it has inherited a bunch of features from its ancestors that haven't changed. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the best evidence that evolution's actually occurred. And that's what we didn't tell you, mostly, in textbooks. So now you can tell a story if you'd like to. But I have to read this card first. <laughs> oh, this is actually really important, as usual. So um, her card says, uh, my dad and I see fossils in our backyard. That's a very important point that I have completely not talked about. There are lots of other categories of evidence for evolution. There's usually five or six of them that are in textbooks. The, the origin of species, uh, again, I won't ask for a show of hands, is a wonderful summary of all those categories, except for genetics, which Darwin didn't know about. Fossils is one of them. I've just talked about that one category of evidence, which is vestiges, remnants, whatever you want. There are lots of other categories. But Darwin has a wonderful quote, which I can't remember verbatim, but basically in the origin it says, if there was no fossil record, if there was no nothing, if there was no other information, this would be enough to convince me of evolution. Vestiges, remnants, things that don't make sense. That's a really interesting quotation because I'm a paleontologist, right? And so is my daughter. Um, <laughs> fossils are powerful evidence for evolution. But as or even better is what I've just described. If you had no fossil record, and all you had were stuff like this, 
most evolutionary biologists would say we would have to believe in evolution. Thank you very much for coming. I don't know if I will answer it. No, you already told me the story. Yes, sir. The tail thing. The tail thing. Really, things go wrong with humans, wrong in that they're nothing like the standard issue, X, X, Y cases. Is that a big aberration of the chromosomes or something? Or the oh, the tail? Yeah. I have no idea. His question is, is how big a deal is it to have an external tail? And that's a great question, and I bet you somebody knows that, but I don't. Um, uh, my guess is that it is a teeny-tiny, itsy-bitsy genetic change. Tiny. Um, that just, because basically what that means is that some things didn't stop growing, right? So it's, that's trivial. So um, X, X, Y, Y, or X, X, Y is a much bigger deal, obviously. Yeah. Um, but he raises another uh, point, which is that things go wrong all the time, right? So, um, and we tend to, there's a wonderful, I, I started to talk about uh, cats and dogs tonight. Um, I just discovered a bunch of websites that talk about the ethics of breeding cats past the point of, what's it called? Breeding for deformation, that's what it was called. And the ethics of breeding cats that don't, that can't function because they look fun. Um, you know, which is, you know, there's an ethical issue there. But the point is that those wouldn't survive in the wild, obviously. But we can make them look like that. And they can turn out that way, and they live at least long enough to get their picture taken. Um, so what is that telling you about evolution? And so there's a whole de field of evolution devoted to monstrosities. There's a whole field of evolution devoted to developmental wacky things. What's that telling us? Not that Persian cats could live in the wild. It's telling us that the DNA of a cat can make something like a Persian. It's semi-livable. Um, uh, uh, and that's telling us something about potential evolution. Um, I always say my favorite animal, my favorite animal in the whole world is Pegasus. <laughs> right? I mean, think about it. How cool would that be? How cool would Pegasus be, right? Why are there no Pegasus? Because there is no variation for wing length in horses. I'm sorry, the last part? If it doesn't kill you, it will continue. Oh, if it doesn't kill you, it will continue. That's a great question. So this is, the, this is if I can interpret, this is also the question of eyeless salamanders. So um, why do salamanders, uh, uh, cave salamanders, lose their eyes? Um, you know, why would you lose them just because you can't see? And the interpretation of that is that just about everything costs something under, under some circumstance. So your eyes cost you something. Think about it, you, if you get a disease or you get, you know, something pokes you in the eye or whatever, then that costs you something. And so if you don't need them, if they don't benefit you enough, then you lose them. So her question is, if they're not maintained by selection, then do you lose them? Oh, sorry. No, my, my, my it wasn't even a question. But what I'm saying, sorry about this, with a slug with a hole in its eye or a whale that has limbs, if it doesn't put that animal at disadvantage where it doesn't get to reproduce, then the genetics of it will continue. Yes. There's no reason for the not, Correct. Not that, not that you know, it goes blind. It happened there was a mutation where Correct. a salamander was blind and it Exactly. So why, why does inheritance continue to produce features? The answer is because they don't hurt anything. 
But then you have to think about cost, and that's why I thought you were asking. So cost is another thing, and this is, this is a whole other question about does evolution actually happen every single day? Probably not. Well, not just that it's slow. Um, you might be familiar with, with uh, research that's been done over the last 20 years of finches in the Galapagos. So you thought we, you know, we thought we knew everything about finches in the Galapagos. Not true, because uh, Peter and Rosemary Grant spent um, decades looking at every single finch on one little island in Galapagos, and they happened to be doing that during droughts and and El Ninos when the environment was very different. They just happened to be there during these changes. And what they found out is that changes happen during those unusual times that don't happen during other times. So the point is that you can live your life perfectly happy with, with doodle boppers on your head and then the environment changes unusually and doodle boppers are a bad thing and you die. So that's, that's actually an important point about seeing evolution happen. And if and I've done this, so you could do it. Stand out on the commons and say, um, sorry, Gary. Um, stand out on the commons and say, do you believe in evolution? Do you accept evolution? About 20% of people will say no because I've never seen it happen. True, true story. Well, we even evolution biologists don't expect to see it happening all the time either. And you can't, even if you can't see it happen, you can see that it has happened. Evolution goes through these, these funnels. Evolution goes through uh, bottlenecks. No question about it. 